Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Reverend Hector J. Hernandez, and I serve as uh, the Connect Coordinator for the National Benevolent Association of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. As we get started, I would like to inform you that this webinar is being recorded and will be available for our future viewing um, on the MBA website at mbacares.org. This webinar continues our 2019 series of webinars and educational training offered by the National Benevolent Association, Prison and Jail Ministries. Today webinar is titled Introducing We Are Witnesses, an important video series about the US criminal justice system. Our presenters today will be sharing and reflecting upon some clips from this video series created by the Marshall Project. The Marshall Project is a nonpartisan, nonprofit news organization that seeks to create and sustain a sense of national urgency about the US criminal justice system, utilizing award-winning journalism partnership with other news outlets, outlets and public forums. If there is time at the end of the presentation, we will host a Q&A session in which we will take questions from the audience. If throughout the seminary you have questions, we will welcome you to use the Q&A feature by clicking on the icon at the bottom of your screen to submit any questions. Please include your email address in case we are unable to answer uh, your question. We, we will follow up with you directly via email after the webinar is over. To begin, let me introduce our speakers. First, let me do this too. First, we have um, Sergio D. Centeno Rodriguez. He works in the youth care. He worked in the youth care worker as at the Heartland Alliance Human Care. That is a detention facility for unaccompanied children. Sergio completed completed his Masters of Divinity at McCormick Theological Seminary in 2014. Sergio is also a pastor, a worship creator, faith educator, community organizer, and an amazing artist. Welcome, welcome, Sergio. Second, we have uh, Gloria Soja. Soja. She is, she works in the pretrial, I'm sorry, pretrial pre services program assistant for Lewis and Clark. County's new Criminal Justice Services Department. is part of a pilot pretrial program exploring alternatives to money bonds in Montana. Prior to this, Gloria served for over nine years as a deputy contact, contact administrator for the Interstate Compact for Juveniles, a national compact coordinator the safe supervision of youth on probation and parole and the safe return of runaways across state lines, and four years as a correctional officer in the Montana Women Prison. Welcome, Gloria. Third, we have Reverend John Harrison, and he asked me to let you know that he's dealing with um, some illness, so if his voice sounds a little weird is because uh, he has some uh, challenges with his uh, throat. John um, is a chaplain at Concordance Academy, a new and wonderful re-entry ministry in St. Louis that works with 250 returning citizens per year. Something interesting about John is that while in seminary, John spent much of his time building a movement 
of Christian witness against the death penalty in Texas. He interned for a year as a chaplain in Austin County Jail, and he did a senior capstone in public policy and incarceration. Welcome, John. And last but not least is our Reverend Dean Bucalos, who serves as executive director of Mission Behind Bars and Beyond in Louisville, Kentucky, and who is the mission specialty with the MBA prison and jail ministries. Welcome, um, Dean. The opinions and comments of all the panelists are their own, and they don't necessarily reflect the opinion of their own work sites. And at this time, I would like to turn the presentation to our participants led by Reverend Dean Bucalos. Thank you, Hector. And I wanna thank the panelists for being with us today and taking time from their busy schedule. Uh, we advertise this webinar as a way to um, encourage and instruct and educate uh, folks in congregations to engage in some difficult questions uh, and dialogue about uh, our criminal justice system, which um, I think most of us will uh, agree is rather dysfunctional and broken. And, and these statistics will uh, I think uh, confirm that we have 2.2 million people in the United States who are in either jails or prison. That translates out to about one in every 115 people are behind bars in the United States. Furthermore, since 1980, the number of people who have be, been incarcerated in the United States has uh, increased fourfold. Four times as many people are incarcerated. Um, and we also know that there's been a disproportionate impact upon people of color um, who have been incarcerated and who remain incarcerated. So we need to talk about that as the church and we need to find ways in which we can become part of a solution to uh, reduce what has become uh, a crisis, both in immigration detention as well as in our, our United States and statewide uh, departments of corrections and in our jails. And we thought that by utilizing this um, video series called We Are Witnesses, produced by the Marshall Project, that it, it would be a way to demonstrate how those conversations can take place in our local churches. So this video series, which we're not gonna show uh, completely, we're just going to show some snippets of this and I'll explain uh, how we'll proceed in just a minute. Uh, but, but this video series has 19 separate vignettes from a variety of people who are involved in the criminal justice system. So there are two police officers, one prison guard, two judges, two parents of, uh, of uh, a murder victim, four ex-prisoners, uh, uh, and a myriad of other people who've been affected by the criminal justice system. So we've asked John and Sergio and Gloria, who are involved in this work, to uh, look through this video series, select one that touched them, spoke to them, um, moved them in some way, and ask them to reflect upon that, why they might have selected that particular passage, and how they see that as a, 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 a useful vid uh, vehicle to uh, begin conversations in their own communities, their own communities of faith. So we're gonna start by watching a short video that, that each one of them selected and then invite them to reflect on that. So we're gonna begin with the John Harrison who uh, selected this particular video uh, about Ed Gavigan. My name is Ed Gavigan. I came into contact with the criminal justice system after being stabbed one night. I was walking down the street. It was about 2 a.m. 
three guys uh, with knives just um, jumped on me without a word and just uh, began stabbing me. The guy on the right had a knife with a 10 inch blade and it just went in behind my collarbone, plunged all the way up to the hilt. I couldn't believe that this was happening to me and I just started to scream. I never talked to any doctor who can believe that I made it. Now I was missing, you know, a dozen feet of my intestines and I was walking with a cane and I couldn't eat or go to the bathroom the way I used to. The stress of that um, combined with the, the flashbacks and um, the nightmares made it really hard to be a functioning person. People would say, how you doing? And I'd say, well, I'm, I'm very lucky, you know? And then I wouldn't say, I can't sleep. I haven't slept in four days or I'm terrified. Or when I ride the subway to a meeting and um, three uh, Puerto Rican kids get on the train, um, I know they're probably not going to hurt me but there's a part of my brain that is freaking out. I was just really angry at everybody else who I saw going along in their day-to-day -day life who had no idea that they could just lose it all. My first thought, I actually did think this, that I will go there and kill that kid. I, I would play it out in my head. I'm gonna confront this kid and I'm gonna have this powerful rage and I'm gonna express how he's damaged my health, my family, my sense of being in the world, how he's ruined my business and, and made me afraid of, of living in New York City. And as I played that in my head, I imagined this kid just looking back at me with, uh, with a sneer. Just like, yeah, so you have a shitty life now, mister. I've always had a shitty life. As I kept working on what I was gonna say, it became more and more important to me to convey to him uh, to convey this idea that we were each gonna get a second chance. If I had died, he would be going to prison for murder. And because I didn't die, he was only going to be charged with attempted murder. I wanted to say to him, on the day you walk out of prison, you're gonna walk out of prison 10 years early, not because of anything that you did. Um, you failed to kill me. I said, on the day you walk out, I would like you to remember today and realize that as bad as it has been, because I don't think it's going to be great where you're going, uh, you, you are now getting 10 years handed back to you. And uh, you should do something with that. I'd want him to learn a trade and uh, and have it have a real job and and have a life and uh, you know maybe get married and have a kid. I'm not sure why it makes me so sad to say that, but that's what I'd want. In management circles, 
you'll hear a nice little axiom that goes something like this. We are perfectly designed to get the results that we are getting. I love that expression because it's so empowering. If we don't like the results that we're getting, we're not stuck. We have the option of changing the design. In theological terms, we have another simpler name for this basic agency in life, and that is that we reap what we sow. So often we hear words like the prison industrial complex or mass incarceration, and we think of a grand tragedy so big and beyond fixing that we're tempted to throw up our hands in powerlessness and lamentation. But I don't see it that way. And I don't find it very productive to frame the issues in that way. Oh, ain't it awful isn't a great form of leadership. In this system, just like any other, a desire for different results calls for a different design. A mass incarceration is a uniquely American phenomenon. And also unique to America is the idea that the people who make this system are democratically elective. And that means the power to change this design remains within reach of ordinary people who are organized to make a change. The power of that design is particularly within reach for the church. There will be people who will say the church ought to stay out of politics, but the word justice is a profoundly theological term. And many of the people in this country who shape our justice system do so with the Bible in hand. And so it's up to the people who know the word of God and the eternal covenant of redemption that God offers. It's up to us to speak up about what a different design of a justice system might look like. That's why I chose this video. I really respect Mr. Gavigan's moral courage and imagination. He's able to grow beyond a fixation on vengeance and live into a vision of the peace his attacker might be able to find with 10 extra years when he gets released. You can see Mr. Gavigan playing it out in his head that a harsh sentence will do nothing to change the underlying reality that led to him being stabbed. And so he chooses in the form of his victim impact statement to plant a different kind of seed. Maybe pick up a trade, he says, or get married and have a kid. You can see on his face that if Gavigan's second chance at life means the person who attacked him also has a chance to live a better life, maybe that person will value life more. And maybe the world will be all the better for that. You see, as, as citizens and as people and as brothers and sisters in Christ speaking in a public space, we have a collective option to plant a different kind of seed in this country. There are people who are perfectly satisfied with the results that we're getting. whose moral vision of justice is to lock people up and to throw away the key. But we who believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ the one who gave his life for us while we were yet sinners, who became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. We are keepers of the promise that God's response to the brokenness of our world is to plant a different kind of seed. In Matthew, Jesus says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And I believe that's our calling today as a church when we talk about these issues. Our conversations about justice in this country are shackled to a language of sacrifice. But I believe it's our church's calling to show people how to introduce mercy into the conversation. Now, to be clear, I don't believe the Lord's mercy has little to do with being nice or having no law, or letting people get away with murder. 
It has much more to do with the promise that the people who live in exile will someday come home. And that's not just being sentimental. If you look at the statistics, 95% of the people in prison today will sometime be released and come home. The choice that Mr. Gavigan walks us through is what do we want to happen when our exiled neighbors come home? Right now, our current moral vision of justice means that 77% of returning citizens will commit a new crime and go back to prison within five years. Our current moral vision of justice means that a child with one parent in prison is nine or 10 times more likely to go to prison themselves. And the cycle goes on and on. Probably the biggest obstacle this conversation faces is how depressing it is to put faces to these numbers and to think about the scale of the system. But in the face of that obstacle, I believe we're called to carry good news with us into every conversation that we can make different choices. Like Mr. Gavigan, we can learn as a society what it means to desire, to desire mercy and not sacrifice. And God willing, we can live to see the results. With that in mind, let's take a look at our next video. I stopped it by an American citizen, Panama. He married my mother and we moved to Brooklyn, New York. I've been here since one years old and this country has been my whole life. My name is Jose Molina. Uh, I'm a legal permanent resident. It was early in the morning, like six in the morning or so. There was a knock on my door. They told my wife they were police. They went through my personal belongings, looking for my ID. Uh, all this time, my wife is screaming and crying. My kids woke up crying. They told me that they were immigration enforcement and that I'm being deported for the crime that I committed in 96, which at that time was like 18 years ago. My childhood was really rough. I lived in the bad neighborhood. I had a stepfather who was uh, abusive and beat on me a lot. I tried to stay away from, you know, from all the, the violence, but it was just really hard. Um, I got bullied a lot um, to the point where I committed a mistake and assault to somebody in self-defense um, that cost me three and a half years in prison. I was released in the end of 99. I got married, I started a family. I made something of my life. I'm a city employee working for the New York City Parks and Recreation. For me, this was really big. I'm like, okay, you know, with this agency I can grow, I could become more professional. It gave me a sense of pride, like it's, you know, it's a city job. I always wanted my kids to feel important about who their dad is and what their dad does. My children looking at me in that light as a professional for, for the city, it's, it's, it's a great feeling. When ICE came to my door, I just couldn't believe it. I was like, but I'm a permanent resident. You know, I'm not undocumented. They handcuffed me in my home and they took me to 26 Federal Plaza. I learned that if you commit a crime as a permanent resident, you're set for deportation. 
to my understanding, when I committed that crime back in 96, I was supposed to be deported at that time. And then 18 years later, I said, okay, um, now we're gonna deport you for this crime. I was taken to a detention center. They put you through the system like if you was a regular inmate. Orange jumpsuit, they put you in a cell, two metal bunks in a cell. You have a mattress, it's just a foam padding. You use your towel or your shirt, roll it up as a ball for a pillow. It's horrible. Going through this process, not knowing what was gonna happen, I still had to stay strong. I'm a husband, I'm a father. Life is still going. My kids still have to go to school. It was really difficult. When my kids saw this happening to me, I think they felt like they couldn't do anything to help me. My daughter wants to be a lawyer, and my son wants to get into law enforcement. It just hurts me that they chose those, I think, because they felt like they couldn't do nothing for me, you know? Those are good careers. So I'm, I'm glad that it kind of motivated them for that, you know? But I didn't want that kind of motivation, you know? But if it ends out good and they become successful people and good people, that make me happy. To this day, I still think I'm, I'm a more American citizen than, than anybody. I don't feel I'm a permanent resident. I feel I'm an American citizen. We cannot hear you. No, we cannot. No, go ahead. So I chose this video because so much of this story resonates with the work that I've done for the last 15 years. Jose is adopted. He was adopted as an infant. His parents could have applied for citizenship at that time. No fault of his own, he has his resident status, grows up in America, lives his life, and commits a crime. And as so many people I've encountered in my work, while guilty of that crime, the circumstances around it would make most people wonder what else could he have done? It doesn't justify the crime, but there's always more to the story. And so he's convicted of a crime and based off of his sentence, three and a half years in prison, most likely a felony. But he serves his sentence, he's released, he goes on to have a family. And our system says that we believe in restoration. We believe that you serve your time, did the crime, serve the time and move on with life. Unfortunately, we know that's not the reality. With the focus on reentry these days, with Second Chance Act and First Step Act, and wanting people to be successful leaving incarceration, I'm confronted with Jose. Here is the person that even 
a victim, Gavana, would say, I want this person to have a good life. I want this person to change and be successful. And here we are confronted with Jose, who has done exactly what Gavin, Gavagna wanted people in this position to do. He's gone on, he's had a family, he's working for the city, he has a good job with good benefits, he's raising his family in a good way. And then there's that knock at the door, six o'clock in the morning, the police come in, in front of his children, in front of his spouse, search his things, and take him away. For something that he did and served his time for more than 18 years before. That's horrific to me. And then it goes on to let us know that eventually he ended up winning his case and being able to remain in the, in the United States because he should have been convicted as a juvenile, adjudicated as, as a juvenile, and it should have had no impact on his adult life. But it's had a huge impact on his life, and not just his life, but the life of his community and his employers and his children. At what point does it stop? At what point is he restored to community? We see this time and time again, and it's easy to just say he's a criminal. It's easy to point the finger at immigration. It's easy to put a label on this individual. But this isn't just a label, this is a human being with a family. This is a, a member of community. At what point can he truly experience success? At what point is he redeemed and restored to justice and to a full life? He's right. He is more American than anything else. He's been here his whole life. This is what he knows. If the law hadn't been enforced 18 years prior, why should we allow it to be enforced now when the impact and the, the ripples go out so much further and create so much more harm? His children didn't ask for this. His spouse didn't ask for this. They did nothing wrong. And yet, they will bear witness and they will bear consequence for everything that's happened. Where's the justice here? Thank you. I'm a New Yorker. I'm born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. My family are from Palestine. My name is Tahani Abushi. I'm an attorney here in New York City. My name is Nasreen Al Amin, and I'm originally from Sudan. I was doing research in a rural part of Sudan, and there were rumors that something like this could be signed. We were gearing up for something by Trump, but we didn't know what it was. His rhetoric towards the Muslim community, um, his hate and angst towards the Muslim community, that was undeniable, unquestionable. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. Frankly, everything was so unclear. Um, and so that, that kind of uncertainty, I think, also made me feel like I wanted to come home. 
So I got on the next flight out from Khartoum. From Khartoum, I went to Bahrain, um, and then I caught a connecting flight to London. I didn't sleep, I, I couldn't eat, knowing that this executive order might get signed while we're on the plane, and I, I just didn't know what I was going to expect. I was driving back from Connecticut, and um, I heard that the van had dropped. President Trump signing an executive order suspending immigration for 90 days from seven countries with ties to terrorism, all Muslim-majority nations. If there was a moment in time that I was created for, it was for this moment. Being an attorney, being a child of immigrants, being Muslim. If I can't do something about this right now, then what have I been gearing up for all this time? When we finally got off at JFK Airport, I followed the regular U.S. citizen green card holder line, went to the machine where you put your green card in. You know, my picture came out with an X on it. And so I went to the immigration officer and then he went to his supervisor. He said, you know, what should I do with this person? And he said, well, just process her like you would a normal green card holder. And as he was walking back, the supervisor said, well, actually, wait, wait a minute. Um, you have to take her in for further processing. I think we were probably um, the first people to get detained under the ban. When I first entered JFK, there was a massive amount of people. Signs, banners, it was really, really robust. It actually gave me chills. I have chills right now just talking about it because it was, such a, a passionate response to this. I just made my way inside the Terminal 4 and I saw the beginnings of what eventually would be our headquarters. I kept asking throughout the night, like, what's going to happen? And I was told, you know, your guess is as good as mine. We don't know. I noticed that the officer was reading the, the language of the executive order. I'm assuming to get some direction on, on how to question us or on what to do. People would call us and say, I have a parent, a grandparent, or a child on the plane. And so we tracked the flight. We'd wait at the entrance of whatever terminal they were exiting. And if they didn't come out after the flight cleared, we'd know, okay, they're in the back. I asked one of the officers um, if I could call a lawyer. And he said, you know, this is a, the border zone that we're in is a special jurisdiction. And we are both judge and lawyer in the space. He started asking me if I knew people with radical views, asked me about like who I was, what I did, where I had lived in the United States. At some point they also searched our bags. <laughs> If the family hasn't heard from them three hours, four hours, six hours, we'd start to press Customs and Borders Protection. Eighth or ninth hour, we would then begin to draft petitions to the federal court requesting that they be released. At some point in the night, we were told that we were going to get transferred to a 24-hour holding area. We were escorted with armed guards. We were escorted out onto the tarmac and taken in this van. I had to put my hands against the wall. I was handcuffed. I thought, this probably means that I'm going to get deported. And I started crying. I just felt like, yeah, there was something about that moment that, that I felt like, okay, this is the, like, we just stepped a line, you know, crossed the line. The detention lasted long enough for us to file, but not long enough for us to be heard by the court. They told me, you know, they had done an extensive background check on me and that they hadn't found anything, quote unquote, derogatory. I was told I could go, I could leave. I came out to an empty airport. It was like three or four in the morning and um, my partner was there, um, and as, as was a friend who had come at three in the morning to bring me some food. I'm hurt for our community, not just the Muslim community, but the immigrant community. The attitude towards Muslims, it's not new. It just made me realize we've got so much more work to do. I want to love America. I consider this my home. 
but I can only love America if it loves me back. So this video I chose because our congregation recently um, started to work through a series about Islam and the Muslim faith. And this video highlights for me the uncertainty and discord created by things like travel bans, even for those who have a legal right to be here. Suddenly, she's treated as a criminal in a justice system that prides itself on innocent before guilty, on proof. Here, we say that you're innocent until you're proven guilty. Nowhere does it say, unless you are a person of color, unless you're an immigrant, or unless you're Muslim. It doesn't say that. It says innocent until proven guilty. And yet here we have masses of people detained and questioned and handcuffed and detained simply because they're from a country, simply because they practice a certain faith, simply because we've labeled them an immigrant. I wonder if we think about Paul and his own persecution of the Christian community, how we would feel if this ban was directed at people of the Christian faith. We know that the travel ban and, and the detention of Thousands of people have separated families and separated couples for years simply because of where they were born, simply because of where they're traveling from. This person did nothing wrong. She was legally here. She was a student studying for her PhD and gets on an airplane to come back completely uncertain of what she will face on U.S. soil. Nowhere in this situation do I hear innocent until proven guilty. And yet she still chose to become a citizen of this country. And to me, her words are remarkable. I can only love America if it loves me back. And on. being harassed one time. I was coming from church. I was probably 14 or 15. I had a Game Boy in my pocket. These detectives undercover jumped out the car, guns drawn. They were like, take your hand out your pocket. And I was so scared because I didn't know if I was going to take it out. They would shoot me. And there was a lady from my church. She started screaming, he's a kid, he's a kid. You know, I think that probably saved my life that day. My name is Tarif Richards. I served as a correction officer for eight and a half years. I wanted to be a part of law enforcement because as a young black man, I feel like if you can't beat him, the best way to do it is to join him. Working in corrections as long as I did, we always, you know, we give each other nicknames and, um, my coworkers and you know some of the inmates, they know me just for always singing. 
always singing, always singing. However, if there's a situation where uh, what that prompts me to react in a manner to defend myself, I'm, I'll eagerly defend myself. So they coined the phrase, sing and swing. <laughs> I don't think correction officers get the respect that they deserve. Wake up every day and you go inside of a jail and deal with people who no one else wants to deal with. A lot of guys are facing life. Sometimes they know they're guilty. They have nothing to live for. I remember my first day inside of Rikers Island, out of the academy. The first thing you smell was just funk, jail funk, we call it. It smelled like a combination of underarms and socks. I remember walking in the areas and everyone is looking at you because they know you're new. Your belt is, your belt is shiny, your, your equipment is shiny, your shield is super polished. And, you know, they start messing with you. I was alone with 50 guys on one side and 50 on the other side. So it was me and 100 guys. And I was walking and I just felt a cold thing on my shirt. A guy had squirted me with urine from out of a toothpaste can. That got me ready for what jail really was about. This particular day, these guys were fighting over a telephone call. A guy swings, hits me. I had to fight my way out of the housing area. When there are riots, you're always outnumbered. We're not armed. Uh, we have pepper spray. You know, that's assuming the pepper spray works. These guys are so used to it, it's just like, they just fan it off and continue fighting. I've gotten some nice lumps on my face, fighting, defending myself. I've gotten cut on my, my right arm with a homemade razor blade. I've had a broken right hand. I can't, you know, do simple things as like simple tasks like to scratch my back or, you know, to reach the back of my neck is very, very trying. I've had um, coworkers who've killed themselves. Um, there are a lot of coworkers who rely on alcohol to get them through. Their, their life after corrections or while they're on the job is very stressful. It's very stressful. I choose a video, um, first of all, because I identify with Richard uh, in, in many ways. I work in a detention facility for minors who are traveling unaccompanied, and they got arrested on the border. Uh, those guys who are children and youth, mostly teens, um, they live in a detention facility and we go there to work every day in a regular basis. And the life of them getting print with the energy and the um, mission and the way in which we perform our job. And also because we believe in what, in what we do. But not all is like that. So I have been working with this uh, community for the last four years and this week I was monitor uh, the time for for the people who the, the dinner time in a in my facility and we we are we are doing um, special accommodation for people who are performing uh, or observing Ramadan and one of my colleagues said oh Sergio uh, go with those people from the Ramadan religion. And I said, oh my God. Oh, thank you. I will go, uh, I will do that, that job. Not because they are from the Ramadan religion, 
but because they are Muslims and I am a Christian pastor and I believe in what they do and I appreciate I highly appreciate what the center do to do a special accommodation for them, but because I I care about that. So, what motivates people to choose to choose a job like that, knowing that it will be both stressful and challenging? How we as a church nurture the life of the people who perform work for the community in detention, with cultural awareness, with religious diversity in form, with mission and care, and how the church support the spiritual path and the spiritual life of the people who, who perform services to the people on detention. Uh, in, in what ways? those waking up every day and going to serve those incarcerated shape a personal lifestyle, lifestyle like it was like me the the worldview the ethical values and actually the sense of ministry how that job that i do uh imprint my life as a pastor as a chaplain as someone who work and care um, for the life of those people who are in detention. I think it's important for us to, to see how this video series not just focus on the person on detention, but also into the whole system that take care of, take, uh, at least take care of the people who not just our detention, but also who provide the services for the people on detention and how we as a church can take advantage uh, of this uh, video series to introduce another uh, point of view into the conversation of mass incarceration of actually into the conversation of the criminal justice system and how we as a church can get uh, better informed uh, to our mission to approach the criminal justice systems system, not just looking at the person on detention or the person who perform a crime, uh, but also who the people who serve that community, uh, the people who nurture the, the life of those people every day. I feel like him. I, also, I'm a kind of actor for them. Uh, every day I arrive with my energy, I put from my uh, humor, the, the, my understanding of faith, the tension, the cultural awareness. I put from myself so much uh, into my job. And in certain ways, this video series honor the people who also serve the community uh, incarcerated. Let's move forward to the next video. Well, I want to thank each of you for uh, sharing your reflections and insights. It's uh, been really, really powerful and helpful. Um, we're not going to watch this next video um, but we included it in our PowerPoint so that uh, if, if those who are viewing it, once this is uh, posted on uh, the NBA website, you can, um, you can experiment with it. You can look at this video and, and uh, there's some prompt questions that we uh, included. And we're hoping that, that this webinar has been um, catalytic for you, that, that you're beginning to think about ways in which uh, you could have a conversation um, in your community of faith or your community about some of these um, very important issues that have so many different facets to it uh, and, and engage our churches in, um, in, a, in a healthy conversation so that we can begin addressing these issues in a, in a proactive way. The, the videos that we watch were from 
uh, as we mentioned, the Marshall Project, and they, they've done two series. One, um, We Are Witnesses was the first series, and, and, um, and the videos that uh, you saw from um, John and Sergio were from that series. And then they have a, a second series called Becoming um, an American, and uh, the two videos that Gloria shared were from that. So I invite you to, uh, to go on the Marshall Project website to, to explore, to, uh, to watch these videos, and, um, and hopefully bring them back to your community of faith. And um, I, I'm grateful for John and Gloria and Sergio for taking the time to, to look at these, uh, to provide some questions that uh, they felt were um, uh, pertinent to the videos that they selected to give you an idea of how you might be able to do this um, in your home community of faith. I'm gonna turn it back to Hector. We don't have much time left, but there may be some questions that uh, are, have arisen. Yeah, um, thank you. Can't hear you, Hector. Can you hear me now? Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, um, I have a few questions here. Uh, we might not have the time to, to go through all of them, but at least let's try to answer uh, one or two. And all of you are welcome to, to, to share your, your thoughts regarding these questions. Um, so the first one is, After watching these videos, um, what, what would you say is the main takeaway for churches and communities of faith and why? And, and, and all of you have already shared that, but, but I, I think it's important that, that we highlight that, the takeaway. Uh, Hector, I would say the takeaway for me is that we have the power to get different results. We have the power to invest in people while they're incarcerated with their release in mind and not just investing in resources with incarceration in mind. We, we have that power today. And that is my takeaway. I think for me, the most important um, piece of the of the video series is the reminder that these are people first the series really brings home the humanity um, that they're not just labels they're not just immigrants and and criminals and offenders and correction officers it's it's really about the, the human being and and seeing the person first and for christian communities and communities of faith i think it's important that the bible calls us not only just to see the human being first but to see christ in every human being Amen. Uh, I will, always, we are um, bolstered by the idea of numbers, the numbers of people incarcerated, the community of uh, Yale or the community of depression, but we don't, we don't focus on stories. And the value of this video series is perform or at least uh, bring the stories of those people on the system and stories change stories inform and stories make a huge difference in the approach that um, people to decide to enter in, in in relation with that so i think that those stories are so valuable are so uh move so much the heart and not, not just the heart but also the pocket or also the understanding and also the the mission of this in this case of the church of the people who who may take care of this uh issue or those issues and i think is the value of this video series is to put on front like gloria says the stories of those in in the system. Mm -hmm. Dean, do you want to uh, also uh, share some of your thoughts? So I'll, um, I'll add to that. Um, the, the, 
the takeaway that, that I um, would bring back to my faith community is, is that, uh, that the church is really something that should be engaged with all these folks um, and, and not uh, see them on the margins of, of our culture and our society. Um, if, if I read anything of, uh, from the Gospels about Jesus' ministry, it was that uh, he began on the margins and invited those folks uh, around him to join him in working with people who've been isolated, who've been mistreated, who have been alienated. Uh, and that's where the church needs to be. And uh, I think we have lost a little bit of our way when it, when it comes to how we um, are living as a faith based community. And so uh, these folks in these videos are our teachers and they can give us lessons in life that we can take back so that as John mentioned, we can be the change and we can uh, create the beloved community because we have the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. Taking, th thank you to all of you, uh, um, but taking Dean's response, um, what will be your recommendation? Um, what do you think uh, will be the first step um, for, for our churches, for our communities of faith, to introduce this video series, uh, you know, to the congregations. Um, how do you think will be a, um, a creative and efficient way to, to promote this in a way in which maybe we bypass our own um, fears and, and we sit down and we learn, like, like Dean was saying, from these teachers, and hopefully um, it has a, a significant impact on, on, on our churches, on our on our communities. So who, who would like to? I wanna, I, I wanna say that uh, this is a great tool for small group gatherings um, to, to provoke sacred conversation. You know, sacred conversations are uh, conversations that not necessarily are easy to approach, but this is a really great tool to introduce a, a complicated uh, theme and at least provide the, the provoke um, questions and then that will help the church to make more understand, understanding about what the mission of the church is in, in terms of um, uh, the criminal justice system. I think the, it could be awesome for small gatherings also to place them in the websites of the churches. Uh, stuff like that will help so much the congregation to understand because the series is serious and the series touch so deeply the the heart of the people who uh, are interviewed or also the people who watch them. Thank you. Anybody else? So, go ahead. Somebody, anybody? <laughs> so, um, I think the last question I, I, I want to, to present to the group and, and then we are ready to, to conclude our time um, is what, why should a follower of Jesus um, watch this and, and why, why should we care? Why should we be concerned? And I will ask each one of you to, in a very short way, to answer this question because we are um, concluding our time uh, together. John. For me, it comes down to the cross. Right, the Romans built the cross very intentionally as a strategy for um, terror and um, social control. The Pharisees used it to dispatch 
an undesirable person from their midst. And Jesus overcame that, right? From the side of the cross where the Romans are standing, their objective is to dominate. From the side of the cross where Jesus is rising from the dead, his objective is to subvert and to liberate. And so we have a choice as Christians in the United States where the church is very empowered and has a, has a complicity in the erection of the cross as to what side of the cross we stand on. Uh, it would be the, the, the fear of standing on the opposite side from Jesus Christ is kind of a wake up call to Christians that, that we, we come to this yoke of oppression as people yearning to be free. Amen. Anybody else? I think as Dean said very, very eloquently that Jesus calls us to meet people on the margins and to bring them in to the circle, bring them in and acknowledge their humanity, acknowledge their, the, that Christ within them. Um, and so I think that's the only way that we can truly be a Christian community is by embracing all that we are afraid of. Amen. Uh, that remind me the concept of broken bread, you know. Uh, we are broken people. We are in the middle of a broken system. And that makes me so much sense when when I look at the the communion ritual. Uh, who 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 go to the table, who claim space at the table who bring others to the table. And I think this is a video series that touched so deep the mission of the church. Uh, even if it was not created necessarily for the church, uh, the church has an important role in the criminal justice system. And we should have more, uh, or at least, at least a deeply understanding about what we do and what we could do in this process of enlightening the, the mission. Amen. Well, I, I'd like to just add that um, one of the uh, benchmarks of the National Benevolent Association as it, as it uh, looks up some of the concerns of the church is to create communities of compassion and care uh, and, and I think that comes directly from the teachings of Jesus. Uh, and I think what we've heard in these videos is the impact uh, that the criminal justice system has on so many different people who are members of our faith communities, not just those who are incarcerated, but also those who have been victims, those who are working in these particular areas. So the, the church is called to create a community of care and compassion for all of those people. And I think that's what Jesus wants us to do. Well said. And with that um, beautiful way to wrap up uh, today's webinar, um, I want to thank all of you for spending your time with us today. Today's webinar will be available soon at our webpage. We ask that you share these resources with others. And for more information um, about MBA prison and jail ministries, as well as all the other ministries and great work that MBA is doing, we invite you to visit uh, our website, mbacares.org. Once again, thank you to all the participants and thank you for the presenters and have a beautiful day.